Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. Happy New Year to all. The first program of the new year right now. It's Friday, the 3rd of January here in Washington, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's a cold afternoon. The wind chills sometimes approaching zero when icicles hang by the wall and Dick the Shepherd blows his nail. This is the time. Uh, this is now the beginning of winter. But uh, the uh, wheels of world historical events grind on. And in particular, I have to thank Glenn Greenwald for uh, really making my New Year's holiday go from wonderful to magical. Uh, when Glenn Greenwald put out a tweet on the 30th of December at 3.41 p.m., I guess that's Eastern Time, Glenn Greenwald, and you know who he is. He's an entrepreneur. He's an up-and-coming uh, media mogul, I guess we can say, with his backing from Almadar and his partnership with Laura Poitras and uh, other figures. And, of course, he's been the the expounder of the thought of Snowden, right? What uh, Thomas Huxley was to Darwin, I guess, is what Greenwald wants to be for the autistic Ed Snowden. And here's the text of this tweet. Ah, this is where all the PSYOP, let's, let's actually do it, we'll do it correct. Ah, this is where all the, quote, PSYOP, unquote, and, quote, limited hangout, unquote, stuff comes from. I love the Internet, writes Glenn Greenwald. Well, what, what's he talking about? My heavens. Well, if we go on, we follow the link. There's a link here. And it goes to an article by yours truly, Webster Tarpley, How to Identify CIA Limited Hangout Up. And that appears on the Press TV website, the article uh, dated back in June. That is, it was a, uh, a rather speedy, timely response to the fakery of the limited hangout uh, group around uh, Snowden. And you can find that at uh, Press TV. Tuesday, June 18th at 8.45 a.m. GMT. Uh, and uh, the operations of secret intelligence agencies aiming at the manipulation of public opinion generally involve a combination of cynical deception with the pathetic gullibility of the targeted Populations, there is ample reason to believe the case of Edward, Edward Joseph Snowden fits into this pattern. We are likely dealing here with a limited hangout operation in which carefully selected and falsified documents and other materials are deliberately revealed by an insider who pretends to be a fugitive rebelling against the excesses of some oppressive and dangerous government agency. And of course, the excesses can be real enough. The excesses, uh, are largely uh, real as far as they go, but uh, that's not the central issue in the ball game. It means that there's something else that the intelligence community cares more about. So Glenn Greenwald has essentially identified me as the world leader and the not just, I guess, conceptual leader, but also leader in terms of uh, getting out in front and counterattacking fast and hard, I'm the leader of the world forces that reject the species of covert operation called the limited hangout op. It's true. I mean, I guess I have to accept this role. I am, unfortunately, um, in the position of leading the forces against false flag terrorism. That's one kind of covert op. But false flag terrorism is not the only kind of covert op. We've also got limited hangout ops, psy ops, 
Mind Control, MK Operations. So I want to thank Greenwald for clearing that up. He regards me as his principal antagonist. Uh, and naturally, I hope that uh, other people will uh, take this up as rapidly and as energetically as possible because it is impossible for one person to stand against this monstrous media cartel. Now, the, uh, the uh, starting point of this, just to reconstruct it a little bit, on Christmas Eve, an idyllic time, and people know what, uh, what, what sorts of uh, homey activities are normally uh, the stuff of Christmas Eve. The Washington Post, Tuesday, December 24th, 2013. The entire paper above the fold, at least four columns and the main headline. There's another column with a smaller headline. But the entire Washington Post above the fold, a four-column headline and a four-column picture, which takes up most of the paper above the fold. Edward Snowden, quote, I already won. His leaks have fundamentally altered the U.S. government's relationship with its citizens and the rest of the world by Barton Gelman. Now, Barton Gelman is, I guess, a competitor of Greenwald in terms of the uh, relative ranking and hierarchy inside the uh, intelligence community's uh, media cartel. And... Um, he therefore describes a uh, conspiratorial meeting that uh, he occur that he arranged with Ed Snowden recently in Moscow. There's a there's a there's a dateline and it says Moscow, but it doesn't say uh, when. Now I had uh, looked at looked at this therefore on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, I wasn't visited by Marley's ghost. I was visited by the Washington Post at my door, and then the interview with Ed Snowden. And I want to point out to people, how dumb do you have to be to understand that if the ruling class regards you as a threat, they, don't, they do not put you on the front page of the Washington Post? How stupid are these dupes? They, they are obviously such pathetic cretins that they actively want to be duped, as we saw back in the case of Obama and then repeatedly since. So Leaker says his mission has been accomplished. Let's take a look. I just want to give you a couple of quotes, because he tells us a lot here. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, uh, some of it's encoded language, but in some cases, the, the dupes, they just don't want to read it. Here's what he says. He's an indoor cat in Russia, but he says the following. Quote, for me, in terms of personal satisfaction, the mission is already accomplished. I already won says Snowden. As soon as the journalists were able to work, everything that I had been trying to do was validated. Because, remember, I didn't want to change society. Let me repeat that. I did not want to change society. I wanted to give society a chance to determine if it should change itself. So he's not a revolutionary. He doesn't even want social change. He just wants to start a debate, change the conversation, as they said back in uh, Occupy Wall Street. We'll change the national conversation. And as we pointed out, it's always changing. It goes from Lady Gaga to Miley Cyrus to Honey Boo Boo to Occupy Wall Street and then on to Madonna and so forth and Britney Spears. Then he says, well, we'll, we'll get you some more prize quotes from Ed Snowden in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Happy New Year 2014 to all. And uh, again, for me, the big event between the years was Glenn Greenwald acknowledging that I, Tarpley, am the leader of world forces opposing PSYOPs and limited hangout operations. Ah, this is where all the PSYOP and limited hangout stuff come, comes from. I love the Internet, and then a link to an article by me, by yours truly. So um, join in. 
come, come on in and uh, let's uh, let's destroy the public credibility of these fakers before they capture the imagination of the younger generation and others. There are lots of dupes out there. You saw it with Obama. You saw it with the Tea Party. Uh, as Cicero once said, the number of fools is infinite. So uh, it's uh, time to get busy and try to provide an alternative. Uh, Snowden says, and you've got to take this seriously, I did not want to change society. I wanted to give society a chance to determine if it should change itself. What does that mean? You want to be a revolutionary leader? I'm sorry, that's not it. That's the opposite. That's some kind of schlemiel. Uh, you have no project. You just want to have a debate. No good. And then he says, I am not, not trying to bring down the NSA. I am working to improve the NSA. I am still working for the NSA right now. They are the only ones who don't realize it. Now, let me say that again. I am still working for the NSA right now. They're the only ones who don't realize it. Well, maybe he's working for the, you know, his direct reporters to the CIA, and therefore the NSA doesn't quite uh, understand. You get the idea. So he's told us about PRISM and these other things. But unfortunately, uh, we knew all this. So um, nothing new. And let me just repeat, take this opportunity to repeat the principle criteria, and I'll do that in a minute. I just want to re remind you of one other thing that, that Snowden says, that the essence of your uh, personality, the meaning of your life, is to be found in privacy, that the, the great tragedy he sees is a time coming when there is no privacy. Well, I would say the, the greater danger that I would regard it uh, and see uh, on the horizon is a time when political action, public, open political action becomes impossible. I think that's what you've got to fight, uh, fight against, and you do that through mass organization, through program, leadership, and organization, and having a strategy, the big four points. And, of course, he strikes out. He's got four strikes against him. Privacy is not the touchstone of the human per personality. It's not the uh, the key to everybody's uh, existence. I'm sorry. It's just not. It is public action, world historical action. Revolutionary action is not private. It's not secret. And the, one of the problems of the people who are so obsessed about their privacy is that their privacy is an empty, hollow construct because they're not doing anything. What, it, what is the, uh, the NSA going to, going to discover? They're going to find that many people are doing absolutely nothing. Now, obviously, <clears throat> we want to uh, prevent the NSA from doing all these things, but we don't need Snowden for this. This is the point. Snowden has told us nothing we didn't already know for more than, what, 13, 14 years. The basic facts of Echelon, the five eyes, U.S., Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The Echelon Five, that has been known since 1998, 1999, when hearings were held by the European Parliament on precisely this subject. The French know about this. They call it the Anglo-Saxon Conspiracy, and there it is. Now, Snowden, of course, has embroidered our knowledge with a couple of uh, code words and so forth. Now, remember, the pattern that we're dealing with here is well established. It is well known. 400 years ago, Fra Paolo Sarpi wrote an opinion for the Venetian Senate how to deal with negative propaganda, right? Confutar scritture maledicae. How do you deal with negative propaganda against you? And he says, avoid adulation. It doesn't make any sense to go out and say somebody, so-and-so is good because people don't trust adulation. The only thing you can do, and this can be, sometimes be more than enough, is to say something nice about somebody while pretending to say something bad. You're pretending to attack 
and you're actually uh, diminishing the level of guilt, hatred, and opprobrium coming towards the person in question, right? If you say Hitler mistreated his dog, this is a cover-up because Hitler's crimes are, of course, infinitely greater than mistreating the dog. But you're pretending to say something bad about the dictator, but in reality, this is a cover-up. So this goes back, that's 400 years ago uh, and, and more, to be sure. The modern characteristics, the protagonist of the limited hangout is the Damascus Road conversion. Snowden wrote in uh, Ars Technica that he wanted leakers, including Assange, shot in the genitals. There is nothing new in what is leaked. As I said, we've known all this since the Echelon hearings back in 1998-1999. There is nothing big. No covert operations are destroyed. None. There's nothing about the Kennedy assassination, nothing about 9-11, the Arab Spring, the killing of Gaddafi, the destabilization of Syria, the Anglo-American role in running Chechen terrorism. No, not a thing. There's nothing really big, and that's the Ultimately, that's the uh, the limited hangout. The NSA taps your phone. The NSA reads your mail. Well, that's bad. Obviously, that's bad. But how compare that to the CIA ran 9/11, or the Arab Spring was a complete fraud run by Western intelligence, and all these other things. Uh, Chechen terrorism is largely run from the banks of the Thames and the banks of the Potomac. How about that? That is somewhat more likely to lead to vigorous uh, consequences. Of course, these governments around the world, total hypocrites, most of the ones in Europe, the British, the French, and so forth, they participate with the National Security Agency. They are part and parcel of these uh, snooping operations. So Damascus Road, nothing new, nothing big. Immediately, there's a media cartel that forms. In the case of Snowden, we see it. It's the Guardian of, Lo of London with Greenwald. Then it's uh, Barton Gelman here at the Washington Post. Now Greenwald is going on to bigger and better things with Almadar. Uh, so there we have it. If you're, if you're an enemy of the establishment, the establishment does not put you on the front page. It leads to more covert ops, and real whistleblowers are ignored. And great careers come out of it. We'll, we'll rehash some of these in the next segment. Welcome back to World Trade Radio. So, Glenn Greenwald identifies my article, How to Identify CIA Limited Hangout Up, appearing on Press TV website June 18th, 2013. <clears throat> 8.45 a.m. GMT. Glenn Greenwald identifies that article by me as, and I will quote, this is where all the PSYOP and limited hangout stuff comes from. I love the Internet. Well, that is an accolade from an adversary, and uh, I hope uh, people take this seriously, but uh, it, it's something that uh, anybody can do. You should, you should too. Uh, don't, don't go, don't be a dupe for this amazing market of dupes that's being organized by these people. And once again, how dumb do you have to be? If it's on the front page of the Washington Post, it's not radical, it's not a threat, it's an op. It's a limited hangout. Similarly, the front page of the Guardian the New York Times, and on and on. So let's just remind ourselves, the hero is a Damascus Road conversion. Ellsberg, Snowden, you can see it clearly. They tell us nothing new. It's all well-known. few little items. Nothing big. None of the main covert ops are blown, and no important politician or other figure goes down, be it in U.S., U.K., Israel, or anywhere else. It prepares more covert operations. Pentagon Papers of Ellsberg prepare Watergate, WikiLeaks of Assange prepare the Arab Spring, and so forth. Um, the real whistleblowers are largely ignored. In other words, people with things that are much more radical, much more explosive, struggle 
to even get the attention of a journalist, much, much less get it on the front page of the Washington Post day after day, week after week. And um, there's an immediate media cartel. Again, I think that's one of the most important ones. Uh, if if it's on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post, Der Spiegel, Le Monde, El País, and so forth, it can't be radical. This is simply the way it is. Um, uh, until you're very close to the seizure of power, uh, and we're we're not that close, um, what the ruling class newspapers print is uh, is going to be disinformation. And, of course, the careers that grow out of it, right? We've, we've noticed that Gnome, Chomsky, Howard Zinn, their careers grew out of their endorsement of uh, the uh, Pentagon Papers of Ellsberg and Halperin and Leslie Gelb. And then uh, the uh, the same story with, with people that we see now. Greenwald is going to be in the media cartel with Poitras and uh, the money bags predator, financier, oligarch, Almedar. So you get the idea. So uh, there it is. Um, and, um, you know, if you want to want to fight these covert operations, make sure you go to tarpley.net. Make sure you buy my books and read them, and you will, uh, you will assimilate the method. And you can do it, too, because uh, the more the merrier, and indeed it takes more. Now let's just apply this also to the... Uh, the situation of terrorism against Russia. You can see the uh, the gloating of the Anglo-American mad dog imperialists as they they imagine that they've created significant difficulties for for Putin. We had a bomb that I mentioned previously in Piatigorsk. Now we've had a bomb at the Stalingrad Volgograd railway station. We've had a trolley bus in Stalingrad Volgograd. These are very serious things. And remember. The principal Chechen Liberation Front, uh, you know what that means, the principal Chechen Liberation Front has an envoy here in Washington. I've written about this repeatedly. It is Ilyas Akhmadov. He's from the Chechen group. He has a Reagan Fassel uh, fellowship. He gets money from the U.S. taxpayer, from the State Department. He gets a secretary in office, a travel budget, and a public relations Budget and there's a similar character operating in London and back in uh, the spring of this year at the Boston Marathon bombing, we found out about Uncle Ruslan, the uncle of the two uh, patsies in this case, right? The two boys, one dead and one now in jail. Uncle Ruslan was married to the daughter of Graham Fuller of the U.S. intelligence community, and uh, when you look at Chechen terrorism, you have to say, well, how, you know, how much of this is NATO intelligence, British intelligence, and U.S. intelligence in particular? And the answer has to be, it looks like a considerable uh, amount. So this is a very, very dangerous um, way to conduct relations with, with Russia. Now, let's we'll just look at a couple of things in the international framework. Um, we now seem to have an attempt by the Saudis and uh, NATO, once again, to say, well, if we can't win the Syrian uh, war, this is not a civil war, it's really an invasion by foreign death squads, if the, if the Syrian war cannot be won in Syria and to some extent in Lebanon, then spread it to Iraq and maybe that will tip the balance in favor of the death squads against Assad, and that seems to be what is happening. We now have a kind of an uprising by pro-Al-Qaeda forces in a number of places in Iraq, and the idea is they're trying to tie down some forces that had been going into Syria to help Assad. In other words, people from the Mahdi army, Shiites, um, pro-Iranian people, pro, pro-Assad people from Iraq had been coming into Syria and had uh, had a beneficial effect on the on the course of the war. It looks to me like the Saudis are now saying Prince Bandar and others are saying in effect, well, if, if we can't win it uh, with the current configuration, maybe if we escalate it and spread it, then in a larger framework we'll have more chances. Couldn't be any worse. 
the hysteria about the barrel bombs, I take it, is simply a uh, cover. This is the Anglo-American press's way of reporting that uh, Aleppo is about to be freed. Uh, Aleppo about to be liberated, the death squads kicked out, uh, and the only way they can express that is the humanitarian emergency uh, and so forth. The, the way out of the humanitarian emergency, which is real enough, is that the foreign fighters should depart the country. Foreign death squad members can have no place in the future of Syria, right? And if it's 50,000 or 75,000 or 100,000, all of them on the Saudi and related payroll, then, uh, then that simply will not work. The other one is uh, South Sudan. Um, this is a place I visited, uh, Juba. At that point, it was the capital of the equatorial province of uh, Sudan. And uh, this is something that the British had been targeting for the best part of a century. Remember, the approach of Anglo-American intelligence is the destruction of the modern state. And we here are very much on the side of the modern state, right? Going back to Milan in December of 1310, right, when uh, when Dante and the Emperor Henry of Luxembourg put the Visconti family into power in Milan, out of that came the prototype of the modern state, the Gian Galeazzo Visconti, uh, a little bit before 1400. The British and the U.S. right now want to destroy that, so destroy the modern state. The Bernard Lewis plan and the previous versions of that from British intelligence, the British Arab Bureau, and so forth, is that Sudan was going to be partitioned across that line where the uh, Arab North ceases and the Christian and animist South uh, begins. There never was a nation there. South, South Sudan is a fictitious uh, country, and the terrible situation is due to the machinations of the U.S., the British, and the Israelis. This was all programmed to happen and it's headed towards a failed state. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. What's the top of in Washington, D.C.? Still basking in the accolade from Glenn Greenwald that I am the world leader of all the PSYOP and limited hangout analysis vis-a-vis his protege uh, and beyond, right? Not just Ed Snowden, but I think he, he says all of it. By that would include WikiLeaks and other uh, points in the uh, in the litany that these characters uh, want to recite. So um, pay attention to Topley.net. Buy some of those books, um, and above all, you know, do what you can on Twitter. You can retweet uh, the things that I put out. Go back to December twenty fourth. I spent uh, m- much of Christmas Eve attacking this interview by. By Snowden, and that seems to have had some reverberations. I did it in in English, French, German, and Italian uh, to get the word out. Um, I would also call your attention to my New Year's statement, my New Year's message. Um, it is, of course, a time when the uh, New Year's message is a highly politicized uh, document. Uh, in particular, I was looking at. Uh, the New Year's message from Snowden, uh, which I think is indeed insufferable, right? The self-righteous prig uh, Snowden, and we've just heard some some quotes from his interview, but his his, his message is, is where he goes into this stuff about the essence of the human personality, the essence of your life and the meaning thereof is what you do in private. No, it's not true. Obviously, you want, we want to defend privacy, but ultimately, uh, it's going to have to go out in public, and you're not going to be able to keep your head down the whole time. And I think that also plays into uh, taking counsel of your fears, and you can't do that in today's world. So um, I wanted to uh, to try to unveil that. So go to my Twitter feed, Webster G. Tarpley, and just go back to December 24th, and you'll see what I was able to, to put together. Right? Just essentially taking these quotes, and I know some – some left liberals on some lists that I sent this to, they, they freaked out. They wanted to uh, to bait me in various ways. How dare you? How dare you? Well, if it appears on the front page of the Washington Post, and then you engage in some neo-McCarthyite tirade against the person who points out the obvious stuff, 
uh, who who are you? What are you doing? I would say to the defenders of uh, of Snowden and Assange and the rest of these people, right? The media darlings uh, and so forth. So um, now that leaves us with uh, with um, economics, and that was the the subject of my New Year's uh, statement. Was fundamentally we're now headed towards a mass strike up surge in 2014, 2015. The stuff is coming in, and it's more and more evident that this is the case. And one way that they do it is, of course, the Assange Snowden operation, people who come and say, look, we have documents, come and look at our documents. And the other one is the clown car, right, coming and saying, I'm a freak, look at me, pay attention to me, Beppe Grillo. Beppe Grillo did a New Year's message. I urge you to take a look. You can go to Beppe Grillo blog, uh, and if you can follow some Italian, you will see a pretty pathetic uh, statement, right? Parliamentary cretinism run wild. Nothing. No mass traction economic demands. Stuff about let's reform the election law. Let's make sure that politicians get less money. This will not save anybody's life out there among the Italian workers, farmers, poor people, unemployed, and so forth. It has no effect. All process reforms, all petty bourgeois. And notice this eerie parallel to the fascist movements of the 1920s and 1930s. When a fascist talks about the revolution, it means dumping the bourgeois democratic uh, apparatus of political representation, right? The parliament, the Congress, the parties, public financing, all that has to go. But wait a minute. That's not the main force of the ruling class. The main force of the ruling class are bankers, hedge fund operators, uh, hedge fund uh, hyenas, as we've always had them, zombie bankers. That's really the class enemy. So if you focus everything on uh, saying the revolution is the overturning of the Congress and the Parliament and cutting them off from public money, it's a fraud. And you're ultimately opening the door to something worse. And you could say that, right? Whatever the Italian Parliament of 1922 was, Mussolini comes on the scene, and by 25 or 26 or 27, you have a dictatorship, uh, and the Parliament is reduced to uh, essentially rubber stamp. It's a big nothing. Hitler showed what he thought by uh, get, sending Goering to burn down the German parliament. So you get the idea. The revolution is not junking the bourgeois democratic parliament, right? You can transcend it, but you're certainly, you certainly don't want to give up those rights and those, uh, those abilities. So the, the goal of the Anglo-American intelligence is the destruction of the modern state, and these people factor in. So I pointed to the cases under the clown car. The ruling class essentially says, well, send in the limited hangout operatives, right? Send in these poseurs, these these uh, self-righteous strutters, and then send in the clowns, right? For people, you know, for the real cult of Dionysios, and remember, the cult of Apollo runs the cult of Dionysios. Wall Street runs this scurrilous uh, plebeian uh, comedy, send in the clown car, send in the clowns. Pepe Grillo is New Year's statement pathetic. He was supposed to be answering Napoletano. I'm afraid it didn't work. Then we have uh, Giudone, who wants the world to revolve around the Israelis, and whatever the Israelis do, you have to take it from there. No, you're going to take your... You take your moves from the mass strike situation, and that, that is going to vary country by country. And, of course, there's plenty to attack in the Israeli foreign policy, uh, but movements that seize power are generally not constructed on foreign policy uh, alone or even primarily. It's got to be mass traction economic demands, and then from that a foreign policy will will uh, follow, which the Israelis obviously will not like. But this it's a matter of um, of the order and the um, the precedence and the relative emphasis that you give to these things. So we've had Beppe Grillo, we've had Diodone, then we've had Jesse, the body Ventura, we've had Howard Stern, we've talked about them. 
in the past. Then, of course, Russell Brand, right, whose uh, uh, antics on the decadent front uh, have, uh, I guess, they, he hopes they've shocked the world, but uh, probably more um, in the line of disgust for somebody like this guy. And remember, it's the new statesman that wants to promote him to the role of the new Lenin. And once again, I have to say, Lenin, whatever you want to say about him, that's, this was some kind of revolution, right, with obvious uh, provisos and caveats. And if you go out and say, all power to the Soviets, peace, bread, land, that's mass traction. Peace in those days with uh, 9 million Russian casualties on the Eastern Front in World War One, the most of any country. Bread, let's get food, and let's have a land reform. That's mass traction. We'll give you food now and then land so you can grow some more for next year. Those are mass traction economic demands. The petty bourgeois Snowden comes out and says, all power to the hackers, all power to the whistleblowers, privacy, transparency, and encryption. <laughs> I'm sorry. Those are petty bourgeois mockeries of a revolutionary or transitional program. And I also have to, I have to single out also the, the antics of Max Kaiser and his charming uh, assistant on his program, uh, where they believe that Bitcoin is the revolution and that uh, the, the revolution will come through encryption. The revolution will be encrypted. It won't be televised. It'll be encrypted. Uh, and again, <laughs> that's all fine, but what about people that don't, they can't even afford one Bitcoin at this point? It's a mockery. It's a petty bourgeois utopia. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. Happy New Year to all. 2014, year of struggle, year of mass strike upsurge, year of programmatic hegemony organization building, the uh, public validation of a strategy, and providing leadership to people, uh, to mass forces, to class forces in motion uh, against financiers, predators, and uh, the uh, oligarchs that dominate this uh, society. And remember, take it from Glenn Greenwald. Tartley is the world leader against psyops and limited hangouts. Uh, looking back to Christmas now, the, the obvious Dickensian overtones are always very thick. Here at the Washington Post uh, on the last Saturday of the year, some interesting uh, cartoons. This is, uh, let's see, it's a, a guy, uh, Scheinman. Uh, doing it for the Newark Star Ledger. So here we see a uh, Republican elephant, a fatherly figure uh, with the Christmas tree, smoking a pipe. He's got a well-worn volume in his hands. Three little kids in front of him. It's obviously Christmas time. And he says, gather round, children. We're going to read Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, a cautionary tale about a brave industrialist who falls prey to the perils of socialism. <laughs> he has socialist hallucinations and decides that Tiny Tim shouldn't die after all and that Bob Cratchit should get a, ruling, a, a living uh, wage. The uh, Washington Post, again, has done an interesting long study by Dan Baltz, B-A-L-Z, their political guy, right, now that David Broder has gone to his reward, we have Dan Baltz, and it's the um, states of polarization, 23 states under Republican control, 14 states under Democratic control. Now, the principal line of demarcation is, do you have a low-wage economy, or is there some hope of a high-wage economy? And do you make investments in your human capital, in your labor force? And we know that the persistent historical problem of the United States, the thing that makes the U.S. different, more backward than many other parts of the world. Now, there are certainly compensating 
advantages in the U.S., but a point of backwardness is this idea that the Confederate States of America had that they were built on was that you could do it all based on slave labor, and if you couldn't have slave labor, you would have low-wage labor, deprived of services, and very little in the way of social safety net. So Dan Baltz goes through all this. He dodges the main question. The question, again, is what I just said. Low wage or high wage, the successful parts of the U.S. economy over time were based on high wage, high qualification, high value added, high capital intensity, meaning high investment per job, and therefore high profits. Yes, indeed. Capitalism, industrial capitalism, creates a real absolute profit. It's not just exploitation. It actually creates something new. So what we what we've got is America, America, and then Austro America. We've got the Austrian parts of the United States. Of course, you know that the founding fathers were all Austrians. George Washington from Austria, and Thomas Jefferson, obviously an Austrian. In, in his case, he really was. Um, but you get the idea. And then we've got the comparison between California and Texas. And uh, here we find. Um, 7.5% of all workers in Texas get the minimum wage or less. The national average, 4.7% of workers get the minimum wage. California, the um, uh, amount of the, the proportion of the working population to get the minimum wage, 1.4%. So you get the idea. There is a difference in Calif- in Texas. As we've always noted, 27% of Texans below 65, below the Medicare uh, eligibility date, uh, 27% of people in Texas below 65 have no health insurance. California, 21%, U.S. average, 18%. Those are all way too high, but you can get the idea, right? Do you want to live uh, under the low wage, no Social safety net, you are on your own. Go go take a look at this libertarianism in four words that you find on Twitter. My version of it is homo homini lupus. Each man is a wolf to his fellow man. That's libertarianism. You're on your own. How about this one? Vi victis. Now, normally that's translated woe to the vanquished. Uh, too bad for losers. I guess, uh, too bad for losers would be another way to put it. Um, devil take the hindmost. Go take a look. Go look at all of those on, uh, my Twitter, uh, account. So we're moving into 2014 with a more, uh, aggressive posture. Now concerning Obamacare, let's spend a couple of minutes on this. Uh, people are now, uh, getting to go to the doctor who couldn't uh, go. And we have uh, interesting newspaper accounts of how this is working for some of them. Uh, it's obviously a, uh, a, it's not a, a uh, homogenous picture. It gets into uh, all different uh, complications. But essentially the idea is the America, it's gradually dawning on the American people that you have a right to health care. And that is more important than whether this is realized under Obamacare, because, of course, it's certainly not realized under Obamacare. But the fact is, you do have a right to health care. Ron Paul said, you do not have a right to health care. I say, and I'm responding to Dr. Paul, Dr. Topley says, yes, you do have a right to health care. Now, um, we had some stories of, of the... the uh, Again, the newspapers are going to be full of these um, accounts, which I think are they're highly significant, of people who could never afford to see a doctor. Uh, we have a woman who's got some kind of a growth on her back. Is it melanoma? Is it carcinoma? Is it squamous? What is it? Um, she has to look at it. Now she can finally go to the uh, to the doctor. But the uh, the one that I would point to is the perspective here, and this is summed up by the uh, once again by the Washington Post um, in the following terms. 
here. Um, what what is the way beyond Obamacare? I guess that's how I would look at it. Just to, once again, we have a woman, uh, no, a guy who makes uh, fifteen thousand a year. He can get himself insurance for eighty seven fifty seven a month. He gets Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, he's thinking. He says, "I'm thinking that maybe after all the talk and the promises and the messy politics." can actually lead to something good after all. Yes, for some, it undoubtedly uh, can. If you have health insurance, you're more likely to get a mammogram, to get a prostate cancer test, uh, and so forth. And here, I think, is the heart of the matter. This is now the commentary of uh, the Washington Post reporter. In healthcare economics, it is considered rational to provide coverage so that people can readily get small medical problems taken care of before they become big, expensive, pent-up medical problems. Gallbladder surgery would be uh, an example. But they say, oh, but wait, this is also a risk because the health plans are signing up new patients, and many of those new patients are the ones who are excluded under the pre-existing conditions exclusion. Unless those plans also attract new customers who are healthy, young, and inexpensive to insure, that will increase the cost. Plans could drop out. Will it happen? No one knows. I'll tell you what happens when plans drop out in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Happy New Year 2014. It's the year of economic populism. It's the year when economic populism defeats the fake cultural populism, right? The blather against the liberal elites. This will now be eclipsed by the question of who delivers real benefits, mass traction, economic demands, life or death issues. Can you keep your home? Can you put food on the table? Can you get your wife to see a doctor? Can you pay your kid's tuition bill? And so on down the line. The point of delivery, class-based fighting demands that I think are going to carry the day in 2014 or 2015, and if they don't, God help us all. So here's the Washington Post, again, the 29th of December. Suppose you get a lot of people who are sick, who have been excluded under the uh, the various uh, you know, money-grubbing predatory insurance companies, have said, well, if you, if you need health care, then uh, you can't get uh, insurance from us because it's a pre-existing condition. And the goal, of course, is to get young, healthy people to join the various health plans, because they're private health plans, right? They're Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Kaiser, you name it, to do it. Suppose the, suppose the, uh, the young invincibles don't join, right? This is one of the favorite scenarios of the Republicans. So um, the new system will find that the costs are too heavy. Insurance rates could go up. Plans could drop out. <laughs> Will it happen? No one knows. Now, in some states, there are already one plan. One plan is all they could get of these private insurance companies to come forward and offer a plan. Suppose we have a number of states where no private insurance company is willing to come forward. Well, I'll tell you what will happen. If the for profit predatory, rip-off, speculating insurance companies with golden parachutes and uh, compensation packages in uh, inter- in inter- interstellar space, if they turn their back on the American people, if the insurance companies turn their back on the American people, the answer to that will be, we've got a plan, it's called Medicare, and where there's no private rip-off plan that's willing to come in and offer something, if they're not willing to do it, Medicare will be brought in to the picture. And that will be the transition away from Obamacare towards the obviously needed Medicare for all. That's the answer. Plans could drop out. If you turn your back on the American people, the American people will turn their back on you and that will be Medicare for all. And it can come on the installment plan. It can come all at once in one big uh, 
shift or it can come piecemeal one state after another. But we've got a plan that works. And, of course, once we've said that, though, if you're going to be treating more people, you need your 250,000 doctors, you need your 1,000 hospitals, and similarly, you've got to restore your NIH cuts, National Institutes of Health, that the fascisto Republicans have insisted on, which are destroying decades and decades of biomedical research. In other words, the biomedical is one of your science drivers. You can't allow it to be destroyed, and we'll get back to that in uh, just a minute. Now, um, in terms of uh, economics uh, in general, the program that we want, w w worth repeating it, is to go on the offensive against this low-wage plan and to insist on high-wage, high-capital intensity, high-energy intensity, high-value-added, high-profit. It means that the absolute profit of society can be expanded and reinvested, and that's where the future will emerge. So the answer is the Wall Street sales tax, 1%, stocks, bonds, derivatives. And that allows us then to say no cuts in the social safety net, and indeed we can actually put some teeth behind the demand raised by Elizabeth Warren, Sherrod Brown, and others to increase the social security pension. I've been talking since the bottom fell out in 2008. I've been stressing that the 401Ks have been destroyed. It's time to increase the Social Security pension. But the only way you can do that without gouging some other group in the society is to take it out of the hide of Wall Street, since they're the only ones who don't pay any taxes. They pay no federal income tax and no sales tax. So the sales tax is how we're going to break their power. The 1% Wall Street sales tax means no austerity and, indeed, increasing the Social Security pension and other similar things. We've talked last week about the need to stop this Trans-Pacific Partnership. We want a 15% tariff. Call it a revenue tariff. Call it a protective tariff. We'll start with 15% and see how we do, and we will fare better. And, of course, the United States can assert um, the – primacy of uh, overwhelming national interest, vital national interest in denouncing some of these ill-advised uh, treaties, right? So we've stopped this giant sucking sound. And we want to seize the Fed. We don't like Yellen. We don't like Bernanke. We don't like this Stanley Fisher with his monster resume. Uh, we want <laughs> Tarpley for Fedhead. That will do the job. That means a five, it's not just, it's not me as an individual, it's a program. Five trillion dollars in credit stimulus, one trillion to at least neutralize the student debt issue by refinancing everything at zero percent, and four trillion for the beginnings of the recovery with infrastructure on your way to 30 million new productive jobs at union wages. Now, the goal of this is it, in, to talk about inequality, I think, slightly misses the point. Um, the goal is not leveling. The levelers, of course, uh, back in the 1600s, they wanted level. Um, leveling is not, not necessary, and it's, a, it's, it's a, a diversion from what you really want. What you want is full employment and a rising standard of living, union wages, regulated working conditions, dignity of work, wages and hours enforced, child labor enforced, so on down the line. Under these conditions, especially a full employment economy with rising real wages and rising living standards and rising longevity, there will be a tendency towards less inequality. But the idea that everybody will eventually come out of it with the same wage bill is an unnecessary utopia, and as a utopia, it's a diversion. It can become a trap. So we'll be back in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Happy New Year 2014. If the insurance companies turn their backs on the American people, woe to them. 
and how fast Medicare for All will be implemented. $100 a person and uh, discounted or waived if you're unemployed, if you're destitute, and so on down the line. We've got to get away from looking at this as a collection of individuals, the way that the obsessive Limbaugh of the uh, Institute of Retarded Reactionary Ranting looks at it. They always want to look at it as individuals. The Austrian school is the psychological school. Everything comes down to the speculator's mindset, right? the psychology of the individual speculative parasite and predator. No, you're talking about a labor force. To develop a labor force, you want them healthy. They've got to live longer. They've got to be trained more. The investment per worker goes up, 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 not just in terms of the fixed capital, the machine tools, and other goods that are part of the job, but also the amount of education per worker has to go up, up, up. You can't afford to have people dying. They've got to live happy, healthy, long lives as a matter of economic necessity. And this is the point where humanitarian values can finally be firmly anchored in the the ontology of labor, right? The the uh, metaphysics of what it means to have a workforce is that those investments have got to be made. Therefore, the low the low wage people, as I've always said, the people down there with Rick Perry in Texas who say, let's have the Confederate low wage model. Factor in that other expense of learning Chinese so that you can take orders, because that's where you're headed with that. How can you compete with sweatshops if you're if you're going to have a low-wage economy. The only way to compete with sweatshops is partly the protective tariff and partly the idea that you have got to go on into areas of technology where they have a hard time following. Now, with seizing the Fed, remember, the cuts to the National Institutes of Health are a direct attack on our biological, biomedical research science driver, which is one of the three principal ones that we want to mention, right? And there are others that, that are being added and can and can and will be added as, as needed right? because it's a dynamic process. The NIH has got to be restored. Of course, the other one is that Obama has destroyed the U.S. manned space program. That is a uh, historical crime. We've just been seeing how well the Cassini works. We've been seeing how well the Mars Curiosity Rover works, we've been seeing the Hubble telescope, uh, and so on down the line. The Voyager, right, which has now gone 12 billion miles. It's in interstellar space. This has got to be relaunched. So there's your space colonization plank and industrial production, indeed, on the moon, Mars, Venus, elsewhere. And then we have the uh, question of high energy physics, and we've been highlighting the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab with the new tokamak that's uh, in operation or soon will be, and then on the horizon, but getting closer, the ITER, I-T-E-R, the worldwide cooperation, United States, European Union, China, India, Japan, and so on down the line, Russia uh, playing an important role. That is the possibility of a breakthrough into energy abundance. In other words, a, a change in the metaphysics, if you want, that we're going to go from ananke and penuria into abundance. The cornucopia will open and Malthusianism will take another heavy blow. Now, they won't stop because Malthusianism is part of the existence of oligarchs. They've got to find some way to separate themselves from the common herd and deny the humanity of others, right? They're useless eaters. They have to be culled. So uh, that's uh, the way it looks at the beginning of 2014. Now, the uh, the left turn of the Democratic Party, de Blasio is now running New York, and Governor McAuliffe will soon take over in uh, Virginia, and indeed his predecessor, McDonald, the reactionary Republican, looks like he's going to go from the state house in Richmond to jail under federal uh, corruption charges. He just went uh, wild with his uh, with his uh, graft and so forth. But let me point out, um, remember, de Blasio is a Soros clone. Now, it's not to be excluded that some of these relations may fray, 
but uh, I wouldn't be um, optimistic. The presence of Bill Clinton at de, de Blasio's uh, inauguration there in uh, City Hall in Manhattan, this simply reminds us that it was Bill Clinton, the worst thing he ever did was to destroy the welfare system. Why do we have 50 million people in the United States who were on the verge of destitution, starvation? Their presence uh, is, is a vector for infectious diseases uh, and so forth. How can we throw 50 million people on the human junk heap and expect to compete with, with China, India, Europe, uh, and, and Japan, and all the rest of the, of the world? It's, it's impossible. So therefore, the right-wing brand of Democratic Party politics from Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton has to be rejected. And they're obviously, de Blasio is getting moderate cover from Clinton, and Clinton is giving moder, uh, getting some left cover from de Blasio and so forth. But um, it doesn't look good. And that the nomination of Bratton is simply continuing stop and frisk by other means. And then the question of the Central Park cabs, horse-drawn Carriages. Now, interestingly enough, the first glimmer of uh, understanding of this that I have is that the goal of wiping out these these horse-drawn um, carriages, right, that we see in uh, you know Home Alone. You've probably just seen it during the holidays in the second uh, installment, right, when the little kid tries to tries to hide behind uh, or does hide in the in the um, the trunk of a of a cab. So. The way that de Blasio has talked about this is that it's, it's a cruelty to animals, right, the ASPCA and all this other stuff. <laughs> well, if you want to believe that, um, I, I don't know if I can help you, but uh, here's, here's the real idea, is that these horses and this entire operation, we can't really call it an industry, but this, this entire activity um, involves certain stables that are slightly to the west of Central Park, uh, over towards the Hudson River, the west side. I think it's the northern edge of the neighborhood known as Hell's Kitchen. And it looks like, according to reports that we heard on NPR this morning, that de Blasio's real estate speculator cronies want to scoop up, they want to bankrupt and scoop up at bargain basement prices these uh, uh, stables where the horses are kept. So as we saw with de Blasio's affordable housing program, it is a gift to predatory speculators. It will not help the average person. And in this case, it actually it, it harms the, the tourist industry because of the traditional associations of these horse-drawn uh, carriages. So that's the uh, down at the plaza, right? Grand Army Plaza, the Grand Army Plaza with the, the statue of Sherman. That's going to be uh, devalued under uh, under De Blasio. Now, the struggle for the minimum wage. You remember that in the November election, there was a successful effort mounted by unions to increase the minimum wage at SeaTac Airport, the Seattle Tacoma Airport, out in Washington state. Uh, and the goal was to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. This is a model program and it has to be supported. But now we've got fascist judges interfering. Here's big government. Let's hear from the libertarians about the big government exemplified by fascist judges interfering with the will of the voters. We'll be back in a minute. And welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So as we were saying at the CPAC airport, Seattle, Tacoma, Washington, there was a successful effort to get a referendum on the ballot back in November to raise the minimum wage to $15 per hour. I think from now on, this $15 an hour is the target. We're going to readjust our programs for the coming mass strike from the SEIU workers at the food uh, fast food emporia in central uh, Manhattan over to uh, SeaTac. This seems to be the rising call. We want $15 minimum wage, and the finance oligarchs can eat the uh, result. But now, the King County Superior Court, apropos of fascist judges, has ruled that the measure only applies to 1,600 workers who work at the Hotel 
and car services, you rent a car, outside the airport. They claim that the 4,700 people who work within the airport are a separate jurisdiction belonging to the Port of Seattle and not subjected to the voters' desires. And what this shows is the only way the ruling class will grant concessions is when the mass strike puts their backs to the wall. There's a very meritorious initiative, but uh, it also shows that, as in, in traditional terms, bourgeois democracy means nothing. And bourgeois democracy goes out the window as soon as real economic interests are in play. So the idea is you have these rampers, the guys who heave the baggage off the planes and onto trucks in the baking sun, the freezing cold and rain, and the roar of jet engines and pollution and so forth, um, heavy turnover, injuries, lots of uh, time loss and so forth. Um, typically, one guy makes uh, $10.88 an hour. So the, uh, that's $1.69 above the Washington State uh, minimum wage. Um, so the, the basic wage around this airport seems to be about $10 to $11. People make $20,000 $20, a year, then get some taxes taken out of that. Um, it turns out that at Los Angeles airports in the much maligned California, it's already $15.00. So I'm wondering, you know, all that ecological stuff, that radical environmentalism up there in Seattle, Tacoma, that seems to have taken a terrible um, toll, right? Are we dealing with green scabs? Are we dealing with that kind of uh, mentality? And the reason, here's an interesting thing. Why do they say $15? Um, the organization is called Yes for SeaTac, and they say they chose $15 because that is what baggage handlers, these these um, uh, rampers and others, the baggage handlers at SeaTac made $15 an hour back in 2005, almost a decade ago now, before the outsourcing began, before this was uh, essentially put up for outside contractors who come in and say, we won't pay for your parking, no health plan, no nothing. So um, this shows that uh, how they got it. And then they also add it's a symbolic figure that has attracted national and international attention at a time when fast food workers around the country were also striking for $15. It's because of the number 15, says uh, a spokeswoman for Yes to SeaTac. 15 captures people's imagination. I think this has become the litmus test in the fight on inequality nationally. Okay, so you get the idea. Time to fight for a minimum wage. And, of course, the 5th of January is 12th night, and then on the 6th we'll have epiphany. And maybe soon after that we'll have an epiphany, who's going to be for this and who's against it when it comes up in Congress. And the scabs and strike breakers, libertarians, Austrians, mainline reactionaries, barkeeps like like Boehner and so forth. We'll see where, where they stand. Will they dare say no to the American people on something uh, like this? And, of course, the, the, the bottom line, uh, the demography uh, of this, this is another problem. If you insist on the low-wage economy, you're going to have declining population. Now, the, the word is from the census and other sources, U.S. population growth over the last several years has been the slowest since the depths of the Great Depression of the 1930s. The U.S. birth rate began to fall in 2006, and it's continuing to fall. And if you want to do something about that, you want to have family values, I would say to fascisto Republicans, if you want to have family values, you better do something about the standard of living. It is impossible to talk about family formation and family values without addressing the material basis of the family. Human beings are creatures of needs, and uh, those needs have to be met if, of course, you want to have a uh, labor force. Now, 
Where did some of the money go? <laughs> How about the Gratz? The grantor, re- grantor retained annuity trusts, and this is now practiced by Sheldon Adelson, by Lloyd Blankfein, by Zuckerberg. It is practiced by uh, 89 uh, uh, this is only a small sample, but at J.P. Morgan Chase, they have a special unit that does nothing but create grats. Goldman Sachs confessed in 2004 that 84 of the firm's current and former partners have been using uh, grats. A guy called Ergen of Dish Network has one. So the estimate is with Adelson, Adelson has transferred $8 billion to his nepotistic heirs, and they have successfully dodged $3 billion in federal taxes, just that one family. And the overall picture is that over recent years, it's estimated that about $100 billion uh, of the possible proceeds of the federal estate tax that $100 billion has been avoided, They, I would say evaded, but it's legal, using GRAT, using Grantor Retained Annuity Trust. So ban it. Ban the, the GRAT uh, and the GRIT uh, that preceded it. One-third of the possible proceeds of the estate tax. Of course, the Republicans call this the death tax. Sorry, boys, uh, this kind of money. You're going to argue that Sheldon Adelson isn't rich enough and uh, he can finance Newt Gingrich and, and Mitt Romney and so forth. I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, the other interesting point, I think, with the historical um, uh, reference, this question about contraception and uh, Obamacare and, and health care plans, the question is, If you're a for-profit employer or if you're a religious organization but you're providing services as a hospital or something else, can you claim an exemption to the federal law because of your religious beliefs? In other words, can you impose your religious belief on your workers? Which is more important, the the religious conscience, the the scruples, and the... the, uh, the conscience of the moneyed employer or the wishes of the workers. And the argument is, well, you can't force a poor profit, you can't force Chick-fil-A to violate their deeply held religious beliefs and go ahead and, um, and allow their workers to get contraception or some other service on their on their health plans. <laughs> I'm sorry. This reminds me of the, the old saying, cuyus, re, cuyus regio, eius religio. This is the Peace of Augsburg in the middle 1500s. The wars of religion in Germany were ended by a law which said, if the duke or the count is a Lutheran, then everybody in that place has to be Lutheran. If they stayed Catholic, everybody has to be that. The idea that the boss has a religious... Uh, uh, right to impose his belief on you, at least in terms of paying for it, I think is completely wrong. Suppose you work for a Jehovah's Witness and he says, I will not pay for blood transfusion. Suppose you work for a Christian scientist and they say, sorry, no hospitals, no doctors, no health care. Discover the power of prayer. I can see a wave of conversions to Christian science as a result of the possible decision in this case. 